This video is brought to you by CuriosityStream and Nebula, my online streaming platform. Hi, welcome to another Cold Fusion video. This is Sri Lanka, population 22 million and an independent island off the coast of southern India. Not long ago, they were South Asia's most developed nation. But right now, they're in a severe economic crisis. The country is $51 billion in debt. Rolling blackouts are rampant. The currency is crashing. Medication, fuel, and some food is in short supply. Even school exams had to be cancelled because of the shortage of printing paper. An economic crisis in Sri Lanka, which is becoming increasingly dramatic, with residents' life savings virtually disappearing into thin air. One estimate from Johns Hopkins University shows real inflation at over 130% in March. The government is even asking airlines to stop refueling in the country to save on fuel. Many Sri Lankans have had enough of the horrific situation. The homes of government officials have been torched, and the sitting Prime Minister even had to flee to a naval base for his own safety. Protesters have also stormed the presidential residence. They were swimming in the president's pool, eating his food, and drinking his alcohol. So how could such a disaster happen? Well, first, we need to look at the Rajapaksas family. You are watching Cold Fusion TV. The Rajapaksas has been a powerful family in the country for a while. Their wealth came from rice and coconut farming, and their power from their activities in politics. In Sri Lankan politics, you have to be somebody to be elected. As Razine Sally, a professor at the National University of Singapore, told the Washington Post, quote, you cannot win in politics if you're not from an established family. The second of nine children, Mahinda Rajapaksas, became president in 2005, and for 10 years, the country became a family business. As the family's influence grew, soon, other brothers, sons, nephews, cousins, daughter-in-laws, and other relatives joined the government, occupying top positions in various administrations. Sri Lanka was now a family affair. Mahinda named his brother Gotabaya as defense secretary, while Basil and their oldest brother, Jamal, were placed in charge of irrigation and economic development. Sri Lanka enjoyed years of growth, fueled by a mountain of foreign debt, but for much of their rule, things were going well. Despite some critics, many Sri Lankans were fans of the ruling family, not only for bringing up the country in social standing, but also for bringing peace to the nation. From 1983 to 2009, there was a horrific civil war in the country. A rebel group called the Tamil Tigers would fight against the government, citing discrimination. After a 26-year military campaign, the Sri Lankan armed forces militarily defeated the Tamil Tigers in May of 2009, and this brought the civil war to an end. At this time, the president and the defense ministry were brothers. After the defeat of the rebels, the pair were hailed as heroes. Mahinda enjoyed the adulation of voters, who approved of his bloody, yet decisive victory in a 26-year civil war against the Tamil rebels. But it wasn't a squeaky clean image for the brothers. Allegations of corruption, including questionable deals with Chinese state counterparts, swirled around Mahinda. His brother, Gotabaya, was also implicated, though to a lesser extent. He was facing scrutiny over the purchase of MiG fighters from Ukraine. But these scandals didn't stop the family from spending big. He promised huge infrastructure projects, including a Chinese-built airport, which sits largely empty. He tried to jumpstart growth by borrowing heavily and attracting foreign capital by propping up the Sri Lankan rupee. In the short term, the strategy worked. The economy boomed, causing a per capita gross domestic product to more than double from 2006 to 2014. This vaulted Sri Lanka past Ukraine, the Philippines, and Indonesia. It lifted 1.6 million people out of poverty and gave rise to a large middle class. By 2019, Sri Lanka ascended to the ranks of the World Bank's upper middle income countries. Though all of that growth came at a cost, Sri Lanka's external debt tripled from 2006 to 2012, pushing total public debt to 119% of GDP. In 2015, these policies were suspended, but the debt continued to accumulate. With each passing year, the family government made even more mistakes. Each mistake led to ever greater risk. 
When the military brother, Gotabaya, got into power in 2019, he promised tax cuts to get elected. When this came around, the government lost 25% of its revenue. To make things worse, in 2020, COVID smashed tourism. For Sri Lanka, tourist income was a huge source of funding to pay back foreign debt. Then, 2021 rolls around and Russia and Ukraine go to war. In an ill twist of fate, before the war, Russians frequently made up the biggest share of Sri Lankan's tourists, with Ukrainians not far behind. As the flights to Moscow were suspended and the Ukrainians are at war, Sri Lanka's tourism industry suffers even more. In April of 2021, the Rajapaksa government made another fatal mistake. To prevent the drain of foreign exchange reserves, all fertilizer imports were completely banned. This move was extremely radical, as no country can feasibly run their food supply on 100% organic fertilizer on a whim. Farmers overnight had to stop producing and the food supply collapsed. The country had to start importing rice and other food goods, and the price of food exploded. Rubber and tea, two major exports, also ground to a halt. The government reversed the policy in November of 2021, but the damage was already done. Last year, in a highly controversial move, the Sri Lankan government banned the use and import of chemical fertilizers overnight in a bid to become the first country in the world to fully adopt organic farming. While the ban was later reversed after protests, the crop yield was already affected. The income we get is not enough to cover our expenses. This is the only work we do. We have no other work. And then things went from bad to worse. The country was spending more than it made, imported more than it exported. As a consequence, its foreign reserves began to run dry. This in itself isn't too unusual, as a lot of countries do this and end up borrowing more money to keep themselves afloat. But the difference here is that the foreign debt for Sri Lanka is so high that they can't even pay the interest to keep the debt expansion going. To make things even worse, oil prices were exploding internationally, so importing that cost even more than normal. And being a small island dependent on deliveries by sea made this a nightmare for Sri Lanka. The inability to import led to food shortages as foreign exchange reserves remain under strain. In February of 2022, the official inflation numbers rose to 17.5%. By June, it was 55%. The price of cooking gas, for example, is almost three times higher than it was just a few months ago. Even printing paper is hard to come by, forcing schools to close and cancel exams. In March of 2022, the Sri Lankan rupee posted its biggest single-day decline in more than 40 years. These next numbers highlight just how fast the situation is deteriorating. Sri Lanka's foreign currency reserves at the end of 2019 stood at 7.6 billion. This had fallen to 1.93 billion in March of 2020. And by July of 2022, all that remains is 50 million. There is no longer enough foreign currency to import basics such as fuel. On June 29, 2022, the country suspended fuel sales. It only had enough fuel for just one more day, and it will be given out in absolute emergencies. It was the first country to ban sales of petrol since the fuel crisis in the 1970s. Before long, the situation was horrific. Citizens began starving and there was a shortage of everything, food and fuel being the most pressing. Long fuel lines are a common sight. Arguments occur and fights break out. One rickshaw driver even dies of heat stroke. The government is now so short on funds that it's going to start printing money to pay employees' salaries, and most of us know how that turns out. It's basically the end of the line for the Sri Lankan economy. Sri Lanka no longer has money to import goods and they can no longer function to produce enough revenue. In April, the government defaulted on its external debt worth 51 billion. 7 billion more is due at the end of the year. Starting in early April of 2021, protests began to erupt all over Sri Lanka. At first, the government tried to squash the protesters, triggering deadly crashes across the country, but they couldn't hold back the tide of anger. The Rajapaksa brothers, once hailed by many as heroes for winning the civil war, are now reviled as leaders. It's a dramatic fall from grace for a family that dominated Sri Lankan politics for over a decade. The former president, Mahinda Rajapaksa, had to be evacuated from his official residence after protesters attempted to storm the house. Other family houses of the Rajapaksas have also been targeted elsewhere in Sri Lanka. People are so frustrated because of Rajapaksas. 
We need our money back. We need our country back. We are here to support us, these people. I mean, everyone can see that how much we are suffering. There is lines everywhere, gas, petrol. Currently, Sri Lanka is in a very risky situation with great uncertainty. And just to highlight this, as I was finishing up the episode, more news broke. On June 10th, hundreds of thousands of protesters broke into President Gotayaba's official residence. The moment the dam broke, and they swarmed into the office of a president already fled. At 10 a.m. local time, he fled. Gotayaba's motorcade was seen speeding down the highway out of the city. His secretary and other officials didn't know his whereabouts, but he was later stopped at the airport trying to flee the country to Dubai. After he left, protesters wearing helmets and waving Sri Lankan flags broke into the president's residence, some cooking food in the kitchen, while others are seen swimming in the pool. There was even a piano sing-along in one of the rooms to lift morale. And for the first time, several Sri Lankan military personnel joined the protesters, marking a turning point in the government's control of the situation. The protests and storming of the government residence also shows what happens when governments lose control of an economy. All other world governments should be watching this closely. Overall, it's a tragic situation. A potent combination of government mismanagement and external economic and geopolitical factors. Moreover, without a stable government, it's going to be very difficult to negotiate loans or restructure the country's debts. So it looks like the end of the Rajapaksa family dynasty and the long years of complete control it exercised over this island nation. So how can this be fixed? Well, basically, the only option is to get loans. Sri Lanka is seeking emergency loans of $3 billion to pay for essential imports such as fuel. The World Bank has agreed to lend $600 million, and the government is also asking for $4 billion from the International Monetary Fund. The IMF said that the government must raise interest rates and taxes as a condition for the loan, which would make the country's cost of living crisis even worse. They're also seeking help from China, India, Qatar, Australia, Japan, the US, and more. Sri Lanka and India have signed a $1 billion credit line for importing essentials, including food and medicine. Sri Lanka owes $6.5 billion to China, and the two are in talks on how to restructure the debt. China agreed to bolster Sri Lankan's foreign currency reserves by swapping the Sri Lankan rupee for its currency, the renminbi. Though since then, China has signaled displeasure over Sri Lanka also approaching the IMF for help. The Rajapaksas are now not only concerned for their political future, but also for their safety and security when a new government takes over. We can only hope that things turn around for the nation and they can get the resources they need to rebuild their economy. No citizen of any nation deserves what has happened to the people of Sri Lanka. So I've been sitting on this script for a couple of months, just waiting and seeing if things would improve, but they really haven't. So I think it's ultimately important that people know what's going on here. So stay safe out there if you're from Sri Lanka. Generally speaking, the news cycle can be quite negative. But what if you could just leave it all behind? Put a stop to the endless doom scrolling and internet arguments? Well, that's what many people have started to do. It's a phenomena dubbed the dumb phone revolution. It's living a life with a phone that only does calls and texts. I've made a cold fusion episode on it, and it's an interesting look into why and how this is happening. If you want to see this episode right now, you can head to my streaming platform, Nebula. Nebula is a streaming platform made by creators for creators. It's going to allow me to experiment with different kinds of content without having to worry about demonetization or the algorithm. And best of all, it's ad free. Nebula features YouTube's best educational content creators like Real Engineering, Polymatter, and Mustard. Nebula is partnering with CuriosityStream. We have a deal where you can sign up with the link below not only to get access to CuriosityStream, but you'll also get Nebula for free. It's not a trial, you'll have it as long as you're a CuriosityStream member. CuriosityStream has thousands of documentaries, everything from Edward Snowden to the Vietnam War, to space and quantum physics, to the soothing voice of David Attenborough. It's all there. For a limited time, CuriosityStream is offering 26% off their annual plan. That's less than $15 per year for both CuriosityStream and Nebula. It really is the best deal in streaming. It's a great way to support my channel and educational content as a whole. So click the link in the description or go to the URL. Clicking that link really helps my channel. Thank you. 
some housekeeping before I leave you. For those of you who follow my music, be sure to check out my new album, Hello World, on Bandcamp. It'll be on Spotify soon. But yeah, that's it from me. My name is Dagogo, and you've been watching Cold Fusion, and I'll see you again soon for the next episode. Cheers, guys. Have a good one.